the blue corner. He comes to the ring wearing red and blue and weighed in officially at an even 130 pounds. Hailing from Fresno, California, he is undefeated with 12 wins, eight of his 12 wins coming by way of knockout tonight in his first title defense. Here is the reigning and defending WBC Continental Americas Super Featherweight Champion, Mark Castro! guys. Congratulations on your championship fight, guys, okay? Do me a favor, obey my commands at all times, protect yourselves at all times. Ten rounds, fellas, good luck. So, Mark Castro, 12 and 0, eight knockouts, 24 years old, had 184 amateur bouts, won 177 of them. In fact, says he hasn't lost a fight in the United States, pro or amateur, since 2012. Sergio, 12 years unbeaten. No, I mean, they're, they're grooming. Matchroom Promotions and Eddie Hearn, they're grooming Mark Castro for, for something special, putting him on undercards with great fighters like Chocolatito and Canelo. And now, you know, this Saturday with Buck Crawford, but he needs to show out a little bit more. Just like we we're talking about with Giasov, you know, you have all the talent, you know, go looking for a little bit more if you're Castro on this big stage. Yeah, and second consecutive 10 round fight for Mark Castro with the 10 round distance with Abraham Montoya in his last fight. And that's a feather in his cap. Montoya has a win over Luis Lopez, who is a world champion at 126. So that's a solid win. For Mark Castro. One of the questions I have about him, though, is this 130 pound weight. It takes a lot for him to get down to 130 pounds. So much so, there are members of his team that believe this might be his last fight at 130 pounds. So, is that weight cut going to make a difference in a fight like this? Beginning of tonight, Nathan Lugo wore the Deadpool trunks. Now we've got Mark Castro in the Spider Man. You noticed that, yeah. Good body work there from Castro with the left hand who's currently rated 33rd by the WBC, unranked by the other boxing organizations. But it's a start. His second fight now in 116 days after beating Abraham Montoya over 10 rounds. It's Castro on his back foot. Normally we see him, and we're accustomed Castro coming forward on the front foot, but, you know, he wants to show... He wants to show that he can box as well, you know, use the ring, try to set up Acosta with a big shot coming forward, getting over aggressive. And he's the smaller man in this fight. Acosta is the fighter that has flirted with going up in weight over the last few years. You can see he is the naturally bigger guy in the ring. That's what I was thinking when you were saying it's tough for Castro to cut down. I'm like, well, what about El Uyu? Uyu, you know, he... He has a body frame to go up and wait a little bit more comfortably than Mark Castro. He's a little shorter. He doesn't have the, the wide shoulders. You know, his legs are a little bit thicker. But I, I, I like the body language of Acosta right now. He's coming forward. There's a good, you know, confident look in his eye. And I like the body language. I like, I like the way he's coming forward, looking to, to open up Castro and take the fight to him. Costa has that type of hairstyle, that, that puffy do, where every time he gets touched, his hair just kind of rattles. Yeah, that's that's the reason you know fighters like to keep their hair short, yeah. especially once you start sweating, and you know the hair gets wet. And he punches, just you know, sweat's going to be flying, whether it's a hard shot that landed or not. Yeah, could affect uh, the judge. A shot that maybe doesn't land that well. Looks like it does because of the hair. There's a right hand. From Castro as El Uyu waves him in. Maybe he shouldn't have done that. Got caught again.
Acosta with a nice jab, and that's what I said. You know, probably his best punch is that jab. It's nice, long, and straight. You know, he kept Acosta, he kept Castro on the back foot. You know, both of them trying to trying to break that range, trying to find their their rhythm, but they haven't really found it yet. You know, it, it was a good opening round for both fighters who, who actually try to get that jab going. We'll see how the second round plays out. So Mark Castro, who was the number one rated amateur featherweight in the U.S. before turning pro. Off to a pretty decent start here after that first round. But if you saw the judging in our last fight, you never know. I think they both had decent first rounds. You know, Costa coming forward, he has his hands up looking to you know, create some openings with that jab. And Castro doing good with the counter shots right now at the back foot. Yeah, but we saw in that last fight, the judges seemed mm -hmm. to like the aggressive fighter, the fighter moving forward, and that is not Castro. That was just what I was going to say. Uh, and, and, and when it comes to fighters that aren't going to be throwing a lot of shots, you know, sometimes just the guy going forward trying to push the fight is going to you know, sway, sway the judges to, to give him the 10-9 run. Nice body shot there from Castro. Yeah, I really like the body work. For Mark Castro. You think Castro has what it takes, Chris, to, to challenge for a world title? I think there's obviously skills there. I just think there's a very long way to go. Uh, he's got good length. He's shown some decent power, especially at 130. Gets a little bit sloppy in there, Sergio, where he, he, he kind of reaches and throws kind of wild punches. You can get away with that on this level, but when you go up against better fighters, those kind of exchanges are going to get you into some trouble. No, it, it's the lack of uh, the flaw technique of his. If you notice how he opens up his elbows, you know, he kind of both elbows when he throws the shots, there's always an opening for body shots. You know, when I study Mark Castro, that's the first thing I will go for, you know, punch in between his shots because notice how his hands are, his guard is up and he exposes the ribs. A nice cool breeze coming here in Santa Monica, right on the Pacific Ocean. Earlier today it was in the upper 80s. Now it feels like it's in the low 60s. Have you fought outside before, Sergio, as a pro? I, ha I have, and I hated it uh, several times, actually. Because I, in the cold in Arizona at night, it was freezing. 40 degrees, I, I believe it was. Really? Like, yeah, uh, on the undercard of Fernando Vargas. And then out at uh, the Home Depot Center uh, in Carson, the fairgrounds. In the daytime, I hated both. Good spell here for Acosta. And he can reach those long arms out. Good right hand from Castro as the final seconds of round two tick down. Well, Saturday night, we've got a six-fight main card, and I'm going to tell you right now, the one that I'm most looking forward to is this one. Is Jared Anderson the next great U.S. heavyweight, or is Bacoli, the wrecking ball, going to freeze him in his tracks? I don't know which way this one's going to go. Look, these guys have been clamoring for this opportunity for a long time. I think Jared Anderson is the more naturally talented fighter, but Martin Bacoli is going to make him dig deep in this fight. We're going to find out exactly what Jared Anderson is made of. I agree. Uh, Bacoli's just mean. He's one of those mean guys that wants to push the fight. Anderson's more gifted and athletic. Talking about, and talking about pushing the fight right here. Both the, both fighters here had their moments. Acosta coming forward, Castro boxing good on the back foot. You know, but I like the cleaner shots and, and, and the accuracy of Mark Castro in that last round. Even the last round before, it was a quiet round, but Acosta's in this fight. Round three scheduled for 10. Mark Castro in the red trunks, black gloves. George El Yuyu Acosta in the white. And I was talking about the weight cut at the top of the show, the difficulties Mark Castro has making 130. Watching him between rounds just moments ago, legs were out, breathing pretty heavy. Already looks a little bit tired.
Men start out round three much more active than the previous two rounds. This crowd would like to see some excitement, a little back and forth. Mark Castro very proud of his El Salvador roots. You can see he's got an El Salvadorian flag on one half of his trunks, Mexican flag on the other side. He considered fighting the Olympics for El Salvador, which is his father's native country, but reconsidered after Matchroom offered an attractive deal. He decided to turn pro. The Olympics just doesn't have the same cachet as it did back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It does not. I think part of that, though, not to make this an Olympic discussion, is that <laughs> there are other pathways for fighters to become successful with the pros. You see fighters like Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney, going down to Mexico, racking up some early wins. That's become a more lucrative pathway than just going the Olympic route. Not, not only that, but the Olympics, you know, they're, they're pushing boxing lower and lower in, in, in television. They're not getting the, oh, the, the eyeballs that, that Olympics hey, used to get. Right now, boxing is not on the schedule for the 2028 Olympics. It's a, it's a shame. You know, That's some here of the, in Los Angeles. Some of, the, some of the greatest fighters of all time that, you know, are, are memorable. You know, George Foreman, Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali. You know, these are all gold medalists, and, and they came out from the Olympics to do great things in the, in the professionals. Oscar De La Hoya. Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, so, so many, you know. Katie Taylor. Andre Ward. I mean, that, that's, that's what sets you up for greatness. And, you know, the, the Olympic Committee not... Not, not being a part of it in boxing, it, it's just a shame. Well, you know, boxing's just had it. Chris can elaborate on this. Boxing's just had a tr has had trouble getting out of its own way at some points, just staying organized. Well, the uh, great Larry Merchant, who's been around Santa Monica all week long, once said, "You can't save boxing, and you can't kill boxing." <laughs> It's Acosta still applying the pressure, but Castro's scoring more of the clean shots. But a little chaotic here at the end of round three. Both men trying to find their punches, and Castro found his. Got him again. This fight's starting to get a little bit rough, you know, a little bit sloppy. You know, both of them not landing clean shots. There you go, you know, with a rabbit punching, you know, trying to punch it behind the head, just trying to land something. There's a nice clean shot there by Castro, but as soon as he landed, he stepped back and, and didn't really look for a combination, you know, because Acosta is one of those fighters that's always going to be looking for for a punch in between, and it's hard to get combinations flowing whenever you're dealing with a with a veteran that's punching in between the shots like that. Round four, here from Santa Monica, California. Castro, who began boxing at age four, said he always knew what he wanted to do. And here he is at the age of 24, 20 years later, an undefeated young prospect working his way up the rankings. Is this the type of fight you thought we would see? No, I, I expected a little bit, a little bit more from Mark, Mark Castro. I mean, it's still early. It's the fourth, fourth round. You know, he's dealing, he's in there with a, with a fighter that's that's been around the block. Acosta. He's one of these, cagey fighters. That's what I like to call them. You know, they they they're good enough to, to compete with with fighters like Castro, but they're oh, not nice good enough left. to they're not good enough to win when when they step up. He's certainly making it competitive so far. Yeah, and that speaks more on, on Castro not doing enough and, and, and instead of uh, Acosta doing something that, that that's impressive. Acosta's now, not doing nothing, you know, nothing great. You know, he's just coming forward looking for the jab. Yeah, and I was talking to Manny Robles, the trainer for Acosta. He said he needs him to go to the body more, a familiar refrain we've heard for much of this card. Thinks he's Ooh. getting in the positions he needs to be in, but when he gets there, he's got to let his hands go specifically downstairs. I think that's a perfect example. 
we just saw. Yeah, Acosta is actually breaking through the guard of Castro with the jab, and then once he does get on the inside and break that distance, is Castro landing body shots. There's a body shot. Good one from Castro that, and another one. That's the way this, this round, the last round has been, you know, but, but Castro is getting hit on the way in, but he's making the better investment downstairs. And, and what I would do with some someone like that is catch and counter. You know, if I was cast, Castro, I would catch and counter Acosta. So you actually want to absorb the shot you know, roll with it a little bit, take the power off it, and come with your power counter shot. To the catch and shoot. There you go, because if you're just trying to avoid it or step back, you're not, you're not going to get points, and it's going to be a, a back and forth of not landing. And again, not to harp on it, but in the very last fight, Miguel Parra and Chakram Giasov, it looked like Giasov won almost every round, but it was a split decision because the judges put a premium on the aggression. No, not only the aggression, but you know, some some punches landed just like a Costa landed a glancing right hand right there. It's not harping on it's odd because that's that's what the judges are seeing and that's what they're swaying towards. They're just the guy that's trying to push the fight. Another fantastic heavyweight matchup. The returning Andy Ruiz, former heavyweight champion of the world, taking on Big Baby Miller. And of course, Chris, we all remember the reason Ruiz had that chance to win the world title is because Miller couldn't fight after failing a drug test. Now, Andy Ruiz took advantage of his opportunity back in 2019, became the unified heavyweight champion. And Jarrell Miller has admitted he's motivated by that experience. Andy Ruiz got something that Jarrell Miller badly wanted. He wants to start to get back some of what he lost against Andy Ruiz. Yeah, that was a big opportunity and a big payday missed by Miller. But here you go, you know, it all comes around. You know, the, the, the guy that took your payday in Andy Ruiz, now you can make him pay. There you go. So is Mark Castro going to end up going the full 10 rounds in back-to-back -back fights. Well, I predicted the last one that was going to go 10. I can tell you this one probably go 10, too. Castro doesn't have that one-punch power, and uh, Acosta is throwing the right shots to, to not let Castro get flowing. Yeah. LUU just three knockouts in his 17 wins, so odds are he's not going to be able to put Castro down. Did you change your strategy in fight, Sergio, when either A, your fighter just didn't have any knockouts, or B, you get in there and you felt that he didn't have much power when he hit you? Absolutely. You know, when you don't respect your opponent's power, then you got to go for it. Even if I wasn't a power puncher, Ty, but I would go for knockouts at least. You know, I would go. Castro does have knockout power. He does have strength. So you need to start going for it if you want to actually do something. And you see moments ago, that center ring apron is continuing to be a problem for the fighters in the ring. And Costa slipped and was trying to plant that back foot. We saw Giasov have problems with it during his fight. So it's certainly perilous territory there in the middle of the ring. Perilous. Oh, looked like a low blow there from Castro. The referee doesn't say anything about it. Halfway through round number five. Wide body shots there by Castro, and, and that's again. I go back to him opening up his elbows. It's, it's kind of a, a, a weird technique that he has. You know, it's kind of a slapping, slapping shots when he goes back to the body because he he opens up his his elbows and and, and the technique's wrong for power. Mark Castro managed by Keith Connolly. He, he's having a pretty good week, huh, Chris? Just uh, a few days ago, Edgar Berlanga, one of his fighters, got the cash cow that is Canelo. Absolutely. Why don't we touch on that, Chris Maddox? Because we're having lunch with Keith Conley, and I was telling him what a wonderful job he's been doing, getting the big paydays for his opponents, and of course, Chris Maddox. Look, Chris has... Castro opening up and landing some power punches, and this is what we wanted to see. As LUU's willing to sit there and take it. Good exchange there by Castro. Wish he kept him in the corner there a little bit more. 
The uppercut's open now for Castro. Acosta's formation, his technique is going out the window now. See, there's a big opening down the middle. If Castro could just act, muster up to just throw one big shot down the middle, it's an uppercut. It'll be a tricky punch to throw, but it's wide open for Mark Castro. Castro landing more power punches in this round. I'd love to see if they tell him in his corner to start throwing uppercuts. There's the action right there, the good back and forth. But it's it's Castro fighting off Acosta. And then sneaky body shots like that, Castro lands, but it just seems uh, infuriated and upset. George Acosta, and he comes back. Good overhand right there landed. And that rock, that rocked Acosta, but Acosta takes a good punch. Like we said, he's never been knocked out. He takes a good punch and he keeps coming forward and Castro's having a hard time and his hands full in this fight yeah best exchange of the night for mark castro and i think we're going to address the issue with the center of the ring right now in between rounds there we saw officials getting in the ring to wipe down the mat which has been a problem as we talked about most of this night but i did love that exchange from castro you know him letting his hands go like that that's his style right now throwing punches in bunches upstairs downstairs good diversity that's how he wins. And he's responsible with it. He's always keeping his chin down. You know, that, that's what he does do really well. He's always keeping his chin down when he's throwing punches in bunches like that. George Acosta has never been stopped. Castro, of course, hasn't either, although he has been dropped. He responded well. That was a big shot, big left hook that he took. Uh, and he responded well, got up and, and, and got... That was, was out, that was outside in Fresno, was it not? Was it in Fresno? I believe it was At in Fresno. At the baseball the stadium. field. Yeah, I Ch remember that. Ch Chukansi Park, that's right. You see, Acosta just slipped once again on that ring apron. I, I, it's always the same spot. Like, they're wiping down the entire center of the ring, but it's right in that white spot of, this, of the emblem in the middle. There is a lot of logos on the canvas. I mean... I understand one or two sponsors, but there's <laughs> how many sponsors? <laughs> hey, I can count don't 15, ever, I think. Don't ever say disparage the sponsors. You out of your mind. They're paying our bills. As Castro again starts to unload, and Acosta does not need to be up against the ropes, despite the slickness in the middle. He's probably better off slipping in the middle than standing still against the ropes. Oh, good combination there from a Castro, who's really starting to let his hands go more. Yeah, he is. He's, he's, he's taking more chances. He actually turned southpaw there and landed a nice straight left hand. He's trying. Mark Gasper's trying to, to find an opening, but, you know, El Yuyu, uh, he's a tricky, tricky veteran. And there's another slip. Under a minute to go here in round six. Each round seems to have a little bit more action than the one before. Well, for Mark Castro with the trunks of Spider-Man, if he wants to dress like an action hero, he better pick up the action himself. I think for Castro, I'd like to see a little bit more of a disciplined approach. Like he's a, a rugged fighter, likes to come in, throw a lot of punches, but while he will throw the jab, it's not really a disciplined jab. He's not throwing it to set up anything else. He's just throwing it out there and then following it up with a 6-7 punch combination. Good uppercut. See, that's, that's a punch I see opening for Mark Castro. Every time he throws it, he lands cleanly. Try to... Coming up Saturday night, Mexico versus Mexico. Pitbull Cruz versus Valenzuela. 
That's the co-main event of the evening. I wonder how much support Valenzuela is going to get from the Mexican fans, Sergio. Will they they split it 50-50 down no. the middle? No way. no way. Pitbull Cruz became a big attraction with the Mexican fans after that tank fight. I mean, he, he, he tank was knocking out everyone. It still is. And Pitbull Cruz took it to Tank Davis in that fight. Mexicans respect a fighter like Pitbull. What a setting, what a scene here tonight, live from the Santa Monica Pier, the world famous Santa Monica Pier. Do you have any memories growing up in this area of the Santa Monica Pier, Sergio? No way. Did you get caught shoplifting down here or anything? <laughs> I, no, because it's Santa Monica. I lived in East L.A., so no, I wasn't in this neck of the woods. All right, we're in round seven, scheduled for ten. I do like the activity of Castro as he lands another right hand there. He's really picked it up and been busier. That's all you can ask for. And, and that's what makes him, you know, the special fighter that Matchroom sees when he starts throwing those combinations. He's he's not he's not a a good accurate puncher. He doesn't have one knockout one punch knockout punch power. So he needs to put those combinations flowing, and they have to keep flowing. That's the only way he's going to be successful and be, get to the championship level. He's one of these old school, you know, like the old school Mexican fighters or, or, or a lot of fighters that have to throw combinations, break down opponents, take their will. That's the, the type of fighter Castro has to develop and evolve into. More body work from Castro, and it looked like Acosta was really clutching those elbows down tight to his body. And the headbutts are getting to Castro. Excuse me, to, to Costa. Those are all headbutts. Yeah, Costa's complained a couple of times about Castro coming in a little bit recklessly, so he's taken a few headbutts. And now, looks like it's starting to cause some damage around that left or right eye. And, and I was talking about earlier, Mark Castro has a, he does a great job keeping his chin down, so he gets away with those headbutts. They're not, they're not on purpose, by the way. Those are totally accidental. He's, he's pushing the action going forward. They're going to stop it? That's it? You know, the doctor got up on the ring apron, had a short conversation with Acosta. And yes, they're going to wave this fight off. It will go to the scorecards. I've seen much worse in, in regards to eye injuries than they allow the fighter to, to continue. Oh, we'll have to hear what the conversation was like with Acosta. If the doctor says to him, can you see, and he responds negatively, perhaps <laughs> there's not much you can do in that situation. But you're right, Todd, as far as uh, eye injuries go, we've seen a lot worse be allowed to continue. Well, there wasn't a lot of hesitation yet. If, if the doctor says, can you see, and he says no, well, you got to stop it. But I didn't really see LUU pleading his case. Well, you didn't see, and he can't see right now either from that right eye, and it was only going to get worse for him. And well, ladies and gentlemen, the coup de grace Saturday night. Terrence Bud Crawford, Israel Madrimov from Uzbekistan. As Madrimov defends his WBA title, Crawford looking to move up to win yet another title in another weight class. Sergio, do you think that fight goes the distance? Yes, I, I think it does because whenever you're dealing with a fighter that's moving up in weight from lightweight, you know, fighting a, a strong, natural junior middleweight, I say going to the distance. So the referee talking to Thomas Triber. And if the injury was not caused by a punch, they will go to the scorecards. If it was caused by an accident, or excuse me, if it was caused by a punch, they would stop the fight and it would be a TKO win for Castro. You don't expect any drama on the scorecards here, do you? Well, we didn't expect drama with Miguel Parra in the last in the last fight, and we got it. So I don't know what to expect. I think Castro was in control. He won the more rounds, but it was Acosta, you know, pushing the fight the majority of those rounds. Let's look at that headbutt again. Yeah. Yeah, but see, no one's to blame right there. Both of them actually yeah. collided. And, and it's because of Mark Castro's, you know, the fact that he, he has, he's more adept at keeping the chin down, tucked away, that, that his head's going to be doing more damage than Acosta who keeps his chin higher.
Well, Thomas Triber has been given the scores. I can see his brain doing the calculations right now. The hamster is in the wheel. <laughs> Triber has a smile on his face. I think he's done the math as Castro's over looking over your shoulder. Don't let him see, Thomas. Don't let him see. There you go. I hate that when everyone tries to see the scores before he announces them. Whatever happened is drama and surprises. All right, Thomas Triber giving us the scores. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout comes to an end at 1 minute 10 seconds of round number 7 due to a eye injury sustained by the red corner from a accidental headbutt. Therefore, we go to the judges' scorecards, and all three judges are in agreement, scoring at the same 70 to 63, all in favor of your winner by unanimous decision. Mark Castro! As expected, Castro was in control. I mean, uh, I did expect at least one one or two rounds going to Georgia Coastal, but yeah, one-sided, one, one unanimous decision. Mark Castro with another win, and another notch on his belt, 13 and 0 now. He's going in the right direction. Not turning heads like everyone wants him to, but progression moving forward.